Here's a question for you. What's British about this image? I'm sure you can tell me where it's from. The Great British Bake Off. But what is it about this tent, this grassy knoll, and these delicate contestants that makes the show so evocative of Britishness? And is this Britishness a good thing? Or is it a bit more complicated than that? Welcome to this video essay on cakes, pastry flakes, and inevitable hot takes. Oh, well, of course you must have right at the boys! So, The Great British Bake Off is a now iconic reality TV series that launched on the BBC all the way back in 2010. Judged at first by kindly Mary Berry and perplexing Paul Hollywood, the show saw a motley crew of contestants plucked from across the very breadth of British society come together to bake. Butter and sugar were beaten, people stared wistfully into ovens, and the phrase soggy bottom was chronically overused by all involved. Yeah, soggy bottom. Also, sometimes Sue Perkins and Mel Gedroich were there to harass this ostensibly thick-skinned cross-section of the country. My dream of an edible car is that much nearer. What? But it transpired that Bake Off wasn't iconic enough not to sell up to the highest bidder. When the BBC tightened its belts in 2016, Bake Off jumped to Channel 4, with its owner, Love Productions, having pocketed at least £10 million from the trade. We're not going with the dough, said Gedroich and Perkins. Little did future contestants know that they would be harassed instead by that ghost bloke from the IT crowd that everyone fancied in 2008, and a small woman who metamorphosed into a bald man upon request in 2020. The pandemic hit some of us hard. So, Noel Fielding, Sandy Toxvig, and Matt Lucas. And Mary Berry? No, Prue Leith, who looks a bit like if you spliced the two original presenters during the golden age of sci-fi. I kid. Prue Leith's a bit of a legend, really. Jokes aside, the programme continued much as before, with equal amounts of controversy, elation, and, well, poshness. You see, Bake Off isn't without its themes, its gentle motifs, its choice of portrayals. While, as I've said repeatedly, the cast of bakers reflect a veritable slice of life from this country, the setting, the competition, and the atmosphere are much less up to date. Of course, it's easy to be caught up in the warm glow. When I was watching episodes of Bake Off back, it really captured me and made me smile. But that's exactly the trick. Let's try and look past Paul's eyes, Sandy's smile, and Noel's legs. For starters, up till now, every single series of Bake Off has taken place in the grounds of an old country house. In series one, they actually did a grand tour of several country houses across the UK. To be fair, one of them is literally called Scone Palace. But regardless, who lives in these sorts of places? How many amateur bakers live in them? <laughs> For that matter, how many aristocrats even live in them? These ornate mansions no longer house lords of the manor. They're tourist attractions, or concert venues, or worse. They're symbols of an ironic past of feasting and tea parties that's all gone. And yet, Bake Off seems to want to revive this world of idle serfs and Wordsworths and various other Victorian twerps. Another oddly vintage thing about Bake Off is the enforced competition. If you don't make exactly eight eclairs, you're in the bin. It's not just about the quality of what you made, but about fitting to the rigid expectations of kindly woman and I man. Remember when that guy got kicked off Bake Off for presenting a bin bag instead of a baked Alaska? That should have been a moment of pathos, but it wasn't. Not really. There's little room for context or hardship, and f me if you want some extenuating circumstances, because you can't have any! It's like an old boarding school! I bet Hollywood Kane's bakers after class if they didn't laugh at his jokes. I really think you have been particularly nasty on this one. There's also the way people on Bake Off dress and how the set's presented. It's all very twee, gingham outfits and prim aprons. Noel Fielding messes with this idea a bit but he's the exception that proves the rule. He sticks out because everything else is so powerfully normal. It's like Alice Cooper's been subbed in to do a Kath Kidston commercial. The colours are all Nigella Lawson-esque. Bunting is everywhere. Decorative tell for 20th century street parties and coronations for a monarch that you still inexplicably manage to give a toss about. This isn't a world that real people live in. Okay, maybe a subset of mums exclusively from Surrey live in this world. 
For my American viewers, it's like if every woman who lived in the Hamptons sounded like a Bond villain. We're on a stealth boat! But when was the last time a kitchen looked this kitschy? I'll tell you when! Never! Most people just bake in regular, slightly scruffy kitchens where they actually live. All of this stuff, the setting, the rules, the presentation, harken back to an imagined past. A Britain of garden parties, prim and proper personalities, and a retrograde attitude to carb loading. But why is Bake Off evoking this nostalgic idea of Britain? And why am I making such a big deal out of it? Transitioning buttery smooth into the theoretical part of tonight's proceedings, we're looking first of all at Benedict Anderson, the man most famous for sticking his finger up at the idea of the nation. Or at least, he tried to stick his finger up. You see, one of Anderson's better known ideas goes a little something like this. You can't go up and touch the nation. And he's right, isn't he? Even if you have a clearly delineated idea of what Frenchness or Japanitude or Botswana vibes actually are, you can't collect all the Frenchies, Japanese or Botswanans in one room and touch them. You definitely arouse suspicion and probably break several bylaws. Okay, but what Anderson's arguing is that national identity is actually quite a diffuse concept. What's more, it can only exist in a world with newspapers and radio capable of spreading news and ideas across an area so large as to give the concept of nation a clear runway. Maps and photographs made geographically constituted peoples more visceral, but also easier to fabricate than paintings or folklore ever could. And of course, this has all been exacerbated further by the 24-hour news cycle and an ever-growing series of screens. One theorist who developed Anderson's ideas was Michael Billig. His theory of banal nationalism suggested that nationalism had come to be presented through commoner garden artefacts, like flags, as opposed to, say, displays of military force. Of course, we still have those, but they're not where the focus is. Instead, to quote Billig, Daily, the nation is indicated, or flagged, in the lives of its citizenry. An ideology once associated with fascism and foreign wars gets sanitised for pop culture purposes. In this vein, Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm noted that nationalism's very vagueness and lack of programmatic content gives it a potentially universal support within its own community. Of course, this is just one interpretation of nationalism. Figures like Ernest Gellner, Ili Kidori, and uh, Lenin would probably figure that there was a materialist component to the whole thing. Imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, and to have a functioning imperial workforce under capitalism, you need a banner for them to rally to, even when they're spun across the seas in penal colonies and shackled kingdoms. But these stories can both be true. One is the why of nationalism, the other is the how. Okay, let's get on with it. It's time for me to cancel another British icon, so get ready to spit El Grey up your heritage wallpaper. Bake Off is nationalist. Or Bake Off is nationalist in as far as it presents British interests and identification with Britain. But can you argue every programme set in Britain is nationalist to a certain degree? Well, yes, but the thing is, as I've highlighted, Bake Off is a bit more overt in its use of nostalgic British symbolism. Flagging Billig's banal nationalism through exactly the kinds of communications media that Anderson would have expected. Nostalgia is something I'd like to delve into more deeply in future, but for now, Friedrich Jameson will suffice. Jameson suggests a depthlessness to modern nostalgias, aspiring constantly to commodify the past and wrench it into the present, shorn totally away from its material context. Nostalgia, in this respect, becomes a signifier for feelings about the past, independent of the conditions that brought them about. So Bake Off looks to a nostalgia about Britain, steeped in imagery from times when the UK exerted even more cultural control than it does now. I feel as though the hard taskmaster of Paul Hollywood is replicated in countless bureaucrats across the ex-British Empire. You can find at least one in every Orwell novel. These were people responsible for unparalleled acts of subjugation and democratic indecency. The country house has more obvious illusions, representing as it does homes for the likes of Churchill, Lord Mountbatten, or old Lizzie Windsor. Three people responsible for unparalleled acts of subjugation and democratic indecency. Okay, there's a bit of a theme appearing here. I think it's easy to sum this up in one simple idea. Looking at the world of Bake Off, it feels as though, irrespective of the contestants' backgrounds or lived experiences, 
They all seem like the sort of people who would probably stand the queen. Maybe they'd be a bit playful about it, but if push came to shove, I don't think they'd hesitate to swear allegiance with Mary and Paul watching on. Anywho, now the queen's dead, but monarchism didn't die with her. We got a new bloke with a big shiny hat, and here I am having to pretend, for Bake Off's sake, that it's not a complete travesty that Mr. Sausage Hands is king now. I think that's the crux of why Bake Off's nationalism is just a touch insidious. It helps keep things the way they are. It instills this stereotype of Brits who are either balefully jolly or powerfully stern, country house fetishists or their inevitable subjects. It's hard to imagine Bake Off existing in a country without private schools, without unresolved colonial baggage, without an embezzling, lobbying, paedophile enabling, unelected head of state. By recognising these truisms that Bake Off puts forth oh so subtly about Britishness, assumptions from a past most of us would rather forget, we can finally suggest that the future might be time for something completely different. Uh, well, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Stick around, subscribe if you want. I'm planning to do a video every month of 2023. I'm going to be returning to Top Gear next month for a kind of redemption arc sort of thing. So hopefully I'll see you then.